Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. I'm Malcolm Panthaki, co-founder of the Revolution and Simulation Online Community and VP of Analysis Solutions at Aris Corp. While evolutionary change is constant and happens gradually over time, revolutionary change requires much more motivation and often occurs relatively quickly. Circumstances need to be dire before revolutionary change is forced to occur and humans resist change, so this is never a simple process. In the case of simulation, the most recent demand for revolutionary change has come from other new and exciting technologies that were essential ingredients of strategic corporate initiatives. For these new technologies to work, they demanded the rapid automated execution of many orders of magnitude more simulation than the status quo could support that experts were needed to run most simulations manually was simply infeasible and unacceptable. Robust and accurate simulation automation is no longer nice to have, but essential. The Revolution and in Simulation Initiative was launched at the NAFEMS case conference in 2018. This is a free web community that gathers in one online space all the resources one might need to take your simulation investments to the next level. It focuses on next-gen simulation usage, helping your organization maximize the impact of simulation on your business goals. Now, case studies are an important resource that's available on the RevSim portal. We've gathered together over 100 interesting cases and that list keeps growing. You can find out what your industry peers are doing to increase the impact of simulation within their organizations. So you know, please join this free community and contribute your own success stories. A number of industry leaders have volunteered their expertise, knowledge, and time to be moderators of a growing list of topics of interest. They curate freely available materials and reference them on the different topic pages. And you can access these topics under the How It Works menu. You can ask questions and start discussions with the moderators. Please do contribute your thoughts and materials to share with the community. Uh, with the help of these moderators and our community, we've gathered together a huge trove of hundreds of resources that you can access under the resources tab. Very few of these are actually stored on the site. The site provides a short summary of a resource and then points to its original location on the web. Please contribute resources that you think would be valuable to the community. And finally, RefSim has a growing list of sponsors, industry thought leaders that are an integral part of this revolution in simulation. The sponsors provide much more than just financial resources to the community and are critical to the ongoing success of this initiative. If you're a solution provider pushing the boundaries of simulation, please join us at refsim.org and contribute to the community. This is the third webinar in the new Learn From Your Peers webinar series hosted by Revolution and Simulation. In today's webinar, experts from industry, anthropology, and ANSYS will present a fascinating case study that brings together new design approaches, simulation, and additive manufacturing to create optimal designs of heat exchanges that maximize performance and minimize the material that's needed. This truly is the future of design, simulation, and manufacturing, and clearly demonstrates that the revolution in simulation is in full swing. Links to this presentation and to a recording of this session will be sent to you shortly after this session. During or after the presentations are done, please enter your questions in the questions panel and the presenters will address them. And with that, I'd like to hand things over to Andreas to get the real stuff started. Andreas? Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm honored to introduce the speakers and the webinar uh, on this topic. Uh, my name is Dr. Andreas Vlahinos. I'm just an early adapter of these technologies for the last 35 years 
and advanced engineering solution is focused on solving new, unique, and difficult industry problems in defense and aerospace, like SpaceX, US Army Aviation, and Missile Command, and etc. Our next speaker, the, then the next three young lads are the brilliant engineers who adapt these tools and run with it. Ryan O'Hara is a technical director for aerospace and defense at N Topology, and he has two decades of experience at the Air Force. Uh, Maki Vlahinos, which I'm really proud, he's my proud son, uh, works for N Topology as a senior application engineer, and he used to work for Advanced Engineering Solutions for eight years. Um, Sanil is a lead application engineer at ANSYS, who specializes in CFD and process uh, manufacturing simulation. So I'll just give the introduction and then let them go. Here's my experience. A quarter century ago, the, I'll just tell you a story. Once upon a time, a quarter century ago, we could generate designs that we couldn't manufacture. I was so excited when parametric feature-based solid modeling came into the workstations. <laughs> they were heavy and expensive. It wasn't PCs yet, but we're very excited to build geometries. But when we go to manufacturing, they were pulling their hair off and says, how do you expect me to carve this internal cavity? You know. So very quickly you learn that the tools were ahead of the manufacturing. Five years ago, we start seeing the enormous progress and advancement in the capability of the new 3D printers. Metals were introduced, high resolution uh, lasers to build the stuff, and we were admiring the demo parts from, let's say, EOS, and say, man, how do we manufacture these things? So about five years ago, we, we have this growth in new machines, faster processes, larger selections of materials, but we couldn't build the geometries. And finally now, Iplicin modeling and, uh, is enable us to do designs that could even imagine before. When you build the gyroid, let's say, in a cylindrical coordinate system or the one you see on the screen, you can see there's a gradient going from the bottom to the top on the thickness. And the gyroid surfaces are so complex, we couldn't imagine that geometry. Try to imagine to go to a CAD designer and say, would you please build this geometry with a traditional tool? which you need to sketch and protrude or evolve or something like that, there is no way. And then with a few clicks, you can see these geometries, which you couldn't even imagine them before the generation. So this webinar, it will focus on interoperability of implicit geometry. What happened now, these geometries are not traditional BRAPs because it's impossible to build that in BRAPs. So they generate these amazing geometries, but the kernel is implicit geometry. So the struggle we have as an engineer is how to go from that implicit geometry to simulation and fabrication tools. So this webinar will focus on interoperability of implicit geometry and advanced computer engineering multi-physics simulation tools. Next. So in the design process, we have a concept. We can generate now these very complex designs, but we need some feedback from simulation of the, to validate the design. So for example, in this case, we can run quickly uh, Discovery Live to make sure the flow goes where we want it, that the geometry is correct and they don't mix and there is no recirculation regions. And the next step is now we have a great geometry we can analyze, very complex, but it's beautiful and very effective. 
Now, can I build it without build failures? For you guys who have been in the additive manufacturing area, you can see sometimes beautiful designs. You try to print to print them, but residual stresses are so high because the energy of the laser, before you take it out, it breaks. I mean, it's really amazing the build failures. So you really need to validate the design and get another loop on the design. So if you see there's build failures and you understand them on simulation, you go back to the original design and you do your design modifications so you can have a successful fabrication and build. So this is the exciting world of design, multi-physics simulation, design process simulation so we can simulate the process what the laser is doing so we can avoid build failures and large distortions and if we find distortions we compensate the design so when it distorts it's where we want it with that i will pass the the speaker to ryan who will continue the presentation ryan Hi. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Ryan O'Hara. I'm our technical director for aerospace defense at and topology. I just wanted to briefly introduce um, uh, some concepts behind our flagship product called NTOP Platform. And specifically, uh, our tool is a computational modeling platform that allows you to do design, sim, and advanced manufacturing um, at a very, like, I would call it the, at the design level, right? And so, um, uh, and, and we're specifically focused on leveraging our implicit geometry kernel to generate shapes and concepts uh, that are often difficult to represent using traditional CAD geometry. And uh, as Andreas alluded to, we, we would call that a boundary representation data of geometry. Anybody who's done large assemblies or models with complex repeating parts will will have felt the pain of working with uh, BREP geometry in this sense, and, and that's a perfect application of our geometry when we need to um, uh, be able to overcome those limitations. Along those lines, uh, we also take a field-driven approach, and the idea is that we are using fields. Uh, if you think about design uh, and engineers, we're always using uh, fields, whether that's a stress field or a displacement field, or maybe a fluid velocity field, and we're using that in our design but um, oftentimes that's uh, purely done by the engineer or the designer themselves, and they have to account for that. We uh, take an approach where we actually allow you or the designer to incorporate that those fields uh, back into their geometry or actually use them during the design process. And then fundamentally, uh, we have a, um, uh, a process workflow where we allow the engineer to like reuse uh, blocks or tools, uh, much like a visual, uh, programming type language. And so that's great because if you're um, developing uh, things and you need to have repeatable processes, we incorporate that directly into uh, our software. So with that said, I kind of wanted to lay out um, you know, an, an opportunity in terms of heat exchange and how our geometry coupled with advanced manufacturing uh, enables uh, new capabilities. And specifically, um, you know, when we think about design, we are focused on designs where we're often space constrained as engineers. Um, I had a, a previous experience with the Air Force and, uh, uh, here in the United States. And uh, often with those systems, the airframe isn't changing, but often the avionics packages and the other things that are associated with that aircraft um, are continually getting upgraded, right? So the, the actual volume doesn't change, uh, but the capability uh, with advanced systems, whether that's electronics, et cetera, um, they're always needing uh, or, or always driving for more performance. And with that performance comes uh, the need to dissipate heat, right? So a heat load from uh, the, the original design has greatly changed uh, from where it is today, right? And so we thought this would be a great uh, application area for our software uh, to, you know, basically provide um, innovation to an area or a design that has little innovation. Right, when we think about heat exchangers, um, and, and specifically today we're focusing on liquid-liquid heat exchangers, they're dominated by tube and shell geometry designs. And uh, lucky for us in this scenario, they're terribly inefficient, right? And so when we think about, when we think about that opportunity, right, to capitalize on these areas, um, we can leverage advanced manufacturing and then design 
And we can do that by moving large amounts of heat uh, in relatively small space, right? Especially in those space constrained environments. And we'll we'll demonstrate, uh, we'll talk today about how we actually uh, did that and, uh, and, and we're continuing to demonstrate that. Um, actually, if you mind going back, Mikey, I apologize. Um, one of the big things uh, that we'll also talk about is, you know, one of the big limitations with these tube and shell designs is they don't actually provide any real heat transfer enhancement capabilities. So we want to talk about, too, in our design process, how we can actually mix and swirl to ultimately increase the efficiency of heat transfer in these applications. And then fundamentally, we're going to demonstrate that uh, in collaboration with ANSYS, right? And so um, now if we can go to the next, <laughs> great. Um, so in this scenario, kind of giving you a tease of, uh, of what's to come um, by my uh, colleagues, uh, both from NTOP and from ANSYS. But in this design, we're actually able to take a, a legacy, this legacy um, tube and shell design. We're able to reduce it from 40 parts uh, down to one. Okay, we're able to reduce the volume by 85%, right? So we're taking up 20% of the space and that's kind of indicated by the image on the right. And then ultimately, even though we had this huge reduction in volume and mass, right? We were still able to actually increase the overall heat transfer of the design by almost a factor of two, right? And then uh, ultimately to compare apples to apples, we're getting about a 10X increase in heat transfer, right? And, uh, and that closely matches with other literature that we're finding. So we're, we're very um, excited about this. And ultimately, one of the things we're also able to do this while uh, minimizing pressure drop, right? So we're able to provide this efficiency by increasing surface area and um, uh, tortuosity in the flow, but we're also able to do it while maintaining um, similar performance standards in terms of pressure drop. So, how do we do this? I just wanted to give a quick background uh, on, on the scenario. And the idea is that we're gonna use uh, what we call triply periodic minimal surfaces. And all, uh, they have a fancy name, but the idea is that they're just really combinations of sines and cosines in 3D space. And then as they increase in complexity, right, it's just more and more combinations of these sines and cosines that ultimately result in an infinitely periodic surface and it's non-self-intersecting, right? And uh, it turns out that these uh, uh, structures have some great qualities to them. So uh, a couple of things associated with these, uh, these surfaces, right? They allow a designer to easily match in uh, hot and cold fluid volumes, right? So in, in the tube and shell design, there's uh, one of the biggest discrepancies that they have is they have a large, uh, I believe it's a large uh, cooling volume and a, and a relatively small, um, uh, hot fluid volume. And then that basically is gonna limit their ability to transfer heat, right? So in this scenario, we get a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio of hot and cold fluid volumes, and that's inherent just to the structure itself. Um, independent of that, uh, these structures uh, have been used in, um, uh, oftentimes in compressive loading situations, and they're incredibly stiff. So when you think about heat exchangers, Oftentimes, there's also, in addition to the temperature requirements, uh, a need to handle uh, fluids under high pressure, right? Whether that's um, in a steam operation or a plant or um, like supercritical CO2 applications, uh, there's all sorts of scenarios where um, the structure itself can actually be the limiting uh, factor in the design. Um, Another key thing for advanced manufacturing is that these structures are self-supporting. So if you need to print them, you don't actually need supports. And then the structure itself is um, key for this uh, scenario here. Um, lastly, uh, the structure itself has isolated hot and cold regions, and that's inherent to the uh, geometry. So there are actually um, multiple domains associated with those. And then along with this, because of the sines and cosines, uh, the fluids inside of these structures are actually going to in, uh, mix and swirl the, the, the fluid itself. And then finally, with the use of our tool through the implicit geometry, we can take these complex structures and not just make cubes or spheres of these objects, we can actually blend them into real world geometry like you see here today. All right, with that said, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Mikey Vlahinos, and he's gonna go over um, uh, how he actually implemented this geometry for our advanced heat exchangers. Thanks, Ryan. My name is Mikey Vlahinos. 
Um, before we get into it, real quick basic recap. Basic modes of heat transfer are your conduction, convection, and radiation. In the applications and case studies we worked on so far, uh, our primary considerations were convection and conduction. And with that, it's basically focusing on surface area to improve convection and uh, reducing thickness. Brian mentioned that these have a strong, these structures have a strong strength to weight ratio. So as materials improve with uh, 3D printing and uh, additive manufacturing, not only will these structures yield themselves to reduce thickness, but improved material properties will as well, culminating in even further improvement in these uh, designs. Some previous work we did was on this fuel-cooled oil cooler. And this was kind of our proof of concept case study in the sense of how applicable are these structures for heat exchangers? Are they printable? Can we start to evaluate and analyze these? And we did this one about a year or so back. And as I explain how the, the flow moves through the heat exchanger on the left, maybe you can try and visualize uh, it in the cross section there on the right. So cold fuel enters through the top port, enters the plenum, moves through the heat exchanger, and exits out the, bo the bottom right. Hot oil enters through the left, moves around the dome, enters the heat exchanger, and exits out the bottom left. At first glance, you look at the structure on the right and you think, man, how, how do these fluids not mix? Well, what we need to do uh, to, to prevent that is essentially create baffles for them. And part of the baffle generation is also going to incorporate our design iterations. The, the two images we see on screen are of this original design, the, the first real concept we had for this heat exchanger. After talking with manufacturing and running this design through ANSYS CFX, we, we got a lot of feedback and, and went back to the, the drawing board, right? That's gonna happen all the time. And the primary things we focused on were A, manufacturability. If we look at the design on the bottom left, we have a lot of overhang and you know, in this case, we would need to add some support. So we re redesigned the exterior. We put some 45 degree angles, not only there, but to the gyroid core itself. We also learned that pooling of fuel or oil is a relatively large concern. We don't want spontaneous combustion, let's say, to cause catastrophic failure in, in really any environment. So we've also increased uh, we also added this angle here to force the fuel in this case to automatically drain out, which inherently also helped for powder removal. One issue with this particular design though, is we now have some overhang. So we thought, man, how can we now start to redesign it even further to still make it self-supporting, but remove any islands or overhangs. So come manufacturing, we have a, a um, you know complete part at the end. The final task that we set ourselves to was improving the pressure drop and flow through the structure itself. At the top, you might notice we have pulled, let's say, or reshaped the exit here of the of the gyroid or the TPMS structure. So that as as the fuel exits that heat exchanger core, it now has a smooth path to follow as opposed to entering a void zone or having low pressure and recirculation zones. All of this information we gleaned from a handful of analyses that we did in ANSA CFX. And these you know, analyses back and forth from design to meshing and, and simulation took around a couple months or so. Uh, later on in the presentation, we'll talk about how we were able to get these design iterations and steps down to a matter of a week and a half. The two heat plots that you see on the right there are the wall heat transfer coefficients. The heat transfer coefficient of the fuel is on the left, 
with streamlines of the oil running around the outside. And on the right is a wall heat transfer coefficient of the oil with the fuel flow running through the middle. It's important to note uh, on this original analysis, we did not do any conjugate heat transfer. It was purely uh, flow. So all of our data and analyses in comparison to our original design and the, the legacy design were all hand calculations. Comparing the original design concept we had to our final design, we, we were able to improve the overall heat transfer coefficient from just the, these two designs by about 12%. And most of that came from improving the way that the fluid entered the heat exchanger core. We had a lot of recirculation and wasted energy in the, the plenum at the bottom. So simply just redesigning, putting an angle to the, to the plenum on the right-hand side there, improved the, the flow as well as you know, making the whole thing supportless come 3D printing. The big takeaways from, again, this like proof of concept design for us was, are these feasible structures? And, and really the answer was absolutely. We saw a 146% increase in surface area. And this was within the same design space. We didn't grow the heat exchanger volume or anything like that. We, we wrapped it in that same design space. With a new aluminum alloy that HRL developed, we were able to reduce the thickness of the walls, and we were really only then limited by the, the printing capability. So we increased the heat transfer significantly more by reducing that wall thickness. And then finally, like I mentioned, when we couple this with ANSA CFX to improve flow distribution, we increase the, the design or efficiency by another 12%. This you know, proof of concept, though, did have its limitations. As I mentioned, it was only fluid analysis. And we really didn't have the geometry to compare it to the shell and tube heat exchanger. And so finally, that's kind of what we're, we're leading up to. And before we actually get into that, we'll talk about how we can start to quantify some of these, these values, such as like pressure drop. We want to not only improve pressure drop so that we can have a more efficient structure, but maybe our whole system can can improve in efficiency. Maybe we can reduce fan sizes, et cetera. And we can do a lot of this with real-time simulation. And then finally, we'll get into uh, the conjugate heat transfer aspect of this, which is, for me, the, the holy grail that we've been missing. And then finally, we obviously have to print these, and we'll get into additive simulation and build prep. So characterizing some of these structures is, it's a big, it's a hot topic right now. There are a lot of people doing it. And what we focused on for this first handful is specifically pressure drop to aspect ratio. We did it with the diamond lattice structure as well as the gyroid. What we have on screen is the diamond lattice structure in this design space or the gray cylinder that we see here on the left. In this scenario, the cell size that defines the, the structure or a shape is one to one, meaning that the cell size in the X and Z axes are the same as well as in the Y. Now what we're gonna start to do is we're gonna stretch that cell size in the Y direction, or you can think of it in the direction of flow. So now we have a aspect ratio of one to five with the diamond structure. And then we're gonna do the same thing with the gyroid as well. So we have an aspect ratio of one to one. And again, we're stretching that cell size in the direction of flow. And the whole reason we want to do this is to characterize pressure drop. At some point, we want to find out because, let me backtrack a little bit. So we see, pressure drop increases the further fluid has to travel through a structure, right? So yes, we get a lot of increased surface area, but at the same time, we might also have a significant amount of pressure drop. So at what point maybe can we find a balance
I apologize, I think my volume cut out. At what point can we find a balance between aspect ratio and, and surface area? And so we were able to do that uh, with the short design study. And really the, the main takeaway from this is as soon as we hit an aspect ratio of one to two for both the gyroid and the diamond, we saw a reduction in, in pressure drop between 40 and 80%. So going forward for me and what I'm encouraging a lot of people to do is, you know, immediately hit that aspect ratio of one to two, keep your part printable and, and improve your pressure drop. And so now we're gonna take these case studies and drive it into our next generation of designs. This is uh, what we're gonna keep this primary topic on for, for this uh, presentation, but before we, get into that, we need to build out the design. This was the first design iteration or the, or the major milestone for this heat exchanger. Before I move on, I'm gonna explain the, the flow and kind of the concept. So looking at the cross section on the left, we have hot fluid enter through the bottom, comes up through the heat exchanger, wraps around the dome and exits out the bottom right. The fluid is allowed to do this because we have introduced a baffle. If you look at the far right, we have a baffle or barrier going up straight through the center until it reaches the curvature of the dome, which allows it to wrap around and come out the bottom right. The cold fluid in this case is going to come up through the center pipe, umbrella around, and exit out the bottom. The reason we kept or started with this design is we gave ourselves the goal of trying to match where the tr original inlets and outlets were. And at the same time, we said, how good can we get the heat exchanger without actually increasing the surface area too much? So we wanted to give ourselves a handful of, of limitations to see what was achievable. The next design iteration we looked at was uh, relatively similar. The hot fluid volume or, or way that the hot domain moved did not change. All we altered was the, the cold. So in this scenario, the, the cold fluid enters through the right hand side, comes up and umbrellas down and exits out the bottom. The final design iteration we landed on was a mimic of the hot to the cold. And I'm gonna come back to this slide in a second and talk about the decisions that, that led us to that final design. And really it was ANSYS's Discovery Live soon to I think just become Discovery that um, led us to there. So all of these design iterations happened within about a week and a half. The image on the left is the first cold fluid volume. The image in the center is that second. We saw relatively good flow, but when we compared it to the hot fluid flow moving through the heat exchanger, there was a significant difference in not just the, the velocity of the flow through the heat exchanger, but we saw about a 55% or so difference in pressure drop. So we said, is there a way that we can redesign the plumbing of the structure so that we can have the cold domain mimic the hot domain. And so ultimately we were able to figure out how to do that. And we not only improved the flow on the hot, but the cold as well. I'm gonna hop back a couple slides and talk about just that for a second. So on the left-hand side, you'll notice that we've done a few things. We have tailored the the plumbing shape so that we move from a we have a smooth transition from the inlet cylinder to the plenum and into the heat exchanger core as opposed to moving into a large plenum volume where we'll have an immediate pressure drop or a significant amount of recirculation the other thing we did is we introduced a second baffle to the design. If you bring your attention to the right-hand side, you'll see there are two baffles running up through the center. 
these are going to force the hot and or cold fluids to again wrap around up through the the dome at the top and exit out the bottom side with that uh, i am actually going to hand it over to sunil now to talk about how ansys incorporates Hi, my name is uh, Sunil Acharya, and uh, I'm here to present the story from the ANSYS team that worked on, um, on, on these simulations from that angle. So once um, Mikey was reasonably comfortable with the design, uh, the ANSYS team first did some simulations to qualify the design for, um, the, um, for a successful 3D printing build, right? So, um, here you're seeing some images from ANSYS Additive Prep that allows a designer to evaluate different build orientation and support strategies. It kind of sits in our space claim um, uh, CA as a CAD tool. And um, with the cylindrical geometry, obviously, a vertical orientation makes most sense. There's not much uh, mystery there. But users can then choose the type of supports to be generated, whether it's tree support or lattice or hard cell or whatever, different style and, and uh, give criteria to do so. And in general, the idea behind the tool is that it allows you to find a sweet spot with build time, support volume and distortion um, from some uh, heuristical algorithm in the background. That way you don't have to run a large uh, design of experiments of additive build simulations, which is a lot more expensive to do, um, to optimize the build orientation. And you know, so you start with a relatively good choice uh, with this um, additive prep tool. And um, you uh, going to the next slide. Um, here is when we took the geometry into uh, the tool called additive print along with the support geometry that was decided which is you know we looked at those couple supports um, that were shown on the previous slide um, including the tree supports um, and uh, this is um, ALSI 10 MG material and the additive print simulation uh, tool which does the simulations um, that are meant to be relatively uh, quick and dirty uh, but give you decent insight uh, rather than the detailed workbench additive approach that we have. And um, on the left, you see some results of distortions and one mesas, so distortions of the order of uh, four tenths of a millimeter, mostly around that rim where um, the inlet and outlet um, for the hot and cold side uh, come and join the cylindrical geometry. And um, they're fairly reasonable, um, other than those hard spots. And simulation results like this allow you to make decisions about the process parameters and also make um, judgment calls on, are you gonna need post-processing depending on what kind of stresses you're seeing? Or is the geometry too deformed and you need to change something in the process parameters and, and rerun the simulation? So, um, the one other thing that I was pleasantly surprised because uh, after doing uh, this for several years now, but mostly working with simplistic geometries like a bracket or you know some simple component, um, I was bracing myself for the experience with the full heat exchanger, uh, um, you know, essentially what is an assembly of 40 parts in current technology. Um, the STL file for that, um, NTOP generated a, one that was roughly about 300 megabytes for this uh, solid uh, geometry. And our tool, the Additive Print, handled it quite well. Uh, so that well, you know, that uh, that bodes well for these kind of implicit geometries and more complex creative designs that people are going to um, come up with with this fantastic technology and. Uh, on the right, of course, um, you can animate these kind of build simulations to see the variables as they get developed 
during the process. So uh, these are some insights from the results. And uh, here is a good example of how these simulations helped us. Um, you see that uh, the one misses stresses uh, and, and blade crash severity on the left-hand side. Uh, we did a couple runs with where we used uh, the supports, the tree supports. Uh, and in another case, we did not use the supports. And we wanted to see how it affects the one misses stress. Of course, with support, uh, we saw that there are less uh, stresses in that critical region that I mentioned earlier. Um, another important output variable that we um, provide is called blade crash severity. And um, that uh, is obviously very much of interest to operators to make sure that you don't have a build that's defective because the blade crashed during the simulation. And the, um, these indices that need to be calibrated based on uh, um, they're based on distortions of, of the geometry. Uh, you see that it does make a huge difference to have those supports uh, in order to avoid uh, potential blade crash scenarios around that, again, the critical area where the inlet and outlets come into the body. And um, here, um, Mikey, when he saw these results uh, very wisely, um, came up with a Quick design change, he adjusted the exterior surfaces in end topology that um, uh, further removes the need for any supports at all. So um, of course, uh, these are the iterative things that you can do very relatively quickly uh, that allows you to come up with a great build strategy the first time around. So um, not having the supports means not only that you're using less material that's wasted otherwise, um, in, in supports, but it also means that you, there is one less post-processing step that you have to do. So um, that was the little bit of insight on how the additive print uh, simulations in ANSYS tools uh, helped us make decisions before the eventual printing of the part. But now I wanna take the story back to what Mikey mentioned earlier, which was, that um, when he did the design iterations um, uh, with the ANSYS Discovery Live tool, um, those simulations primarily allowed him to make sure that there weren't large recirculation zones that are going to stagnate the flows in the flow passages. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that the entire um, operation of this design was validated and so that's when we took the files from Mikey for the design and and did a full conjugate heat conjugate heat transfer analysis um, in our ANSYS Fluent tool and what you're seeing um, and again this was um, a wonderful surprise for me um, as to how quickly we were able to do this um, a few years back about four years back I would say I would not have touched this problem, uh, but our um, new uh, changes to these kind of uh, technology, especially in meshing, uh, this is influent meshing, um, it has made these kind of things possible. So um, we wanna preserve all the details of the intricate geometry. We wanna get a nice conformal mesh if possible, which we did uh, between the heart and um, Solid, hard and cold zones, uh, sorry, hard and solid and cold and solid zones, et cetera, et cetera. And the mesh uh, uh, was done on the STL files. There were roughly a little over one gigabyte between the two fluid zones and the solid region. It was more than a gigabyte that I got from Mikey. And um, you see here that there were about 75 million cells mesh created with fluent meshing, primarily hex core mesh. Also, it had nice inflation regions to account for the uh, proper um, capture of boundary layers, et cetera, et cetera. So very nice um, effort, uh, very nice surprise considering that the effort was reasonable. Uh, within less than a day, uh, we were able to mesh this geometry and also similar effort for the original uh, design geometry that we're comparing this with. And the cross section over here on the top right shows the um, 
hot and the cold zone and you'll see the solid zone which is kind of like this uh, orange gray region so all those uh, um, zones uh, were meshed properly and so um, what does this mean for results so um, first thing first um, this was like I said about 75 million cells it took about two hours on a uh, 196 cores I think uh, with this turbulent flow um, simulation using a RANS depiction, which is a reliable k epsilon type of model. And um, the first thing that jumps out is what Mikey was trying to do, which is to get the fluid to kind of swirl and view around the entire volume. Uh, you're able to see that in the trajectory, right, of the flow. And, um, uh, you know, no surprise that as you look at the temperatures starting from the bottom going up to the top um, you're seeing the hot and the cold contours kind of come together almost converge um, in a well you know coordinated fashion almost so uh, i think it's uh, nice how the uh, beauty of the underlying geometric paradigm is is showing in this um, cfd results and again another view of uh, section view of temperatures of um, the fluid and the solid regions and um, another typical metric for such heat exchanger uh, performance evaluations would be the wall surface of the uh, sorry wall surface heat flux uh, for the different um, fluid and solid regions so um, with this over brief overview of the cfd results i wanted to pass it back to Ryan for the finale. Okay. Yeah, so like we alluded to before, you know, I uh, just wanted to kind of reemphasize uh, the potential here. And, um, you know, in another talk I gave recently, um, our whole goal is to, to, is to be able to, and it's kind of the founding of our company, right? In, in this title of our company, the name of our company is N Topology. It's really for any topology. And the idea here is that we really want to leverage or allow designers to be bold in their design, right? Um, and we presented a scenario here where we could take something uh, that's relatively inefficient in its design and apply our modern techniques and skills and demonstrate how you can provide a huge benefit to us, or a huge benefit to your parts, right? And if you really leverage design and then you couple that with advanced simulation, you can do this iteration quickly, and then you can also, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, go to the next step and manufacture and test those parts, right? So in this scenario, we're showing a lot of potential benefits. You know, do you want to caveat, caveat that this is this is a, a revolu revolution is revolution in simulation, right? And then the next piece of this project is to demonstrate this uh, experimentally, right? And so we're working on uh, process on on the path forward to do that. So. Uh, much much more to stay tuned here. But again, just a huge emphasis on the reduction of parts from 40 to 1, 80% reduction in volume and mass, right? Double the increase in uh, heat transfer. Uh, I know it sounds a little bit too good to be true when I start going through all these things, but um, the key here is that even if we weren't able to meet all these um, um, goals uh, in simulation, right? Even if we got um, maybe even half of these values, right? That would be a huge increase in performance, right? Uh, compared to what we have today. And I think that's a, a great stepping stone or um, opportunity to go into some questions maybe. Or I guess in the summary, sorry. <laughs> um, I, and I think to this point, you know, is, uh, you know, uh, I kind of mentioned before, I joined in topology because uh, I saw the true potential of implicit geometry and the designs we can enable. It's we are living in an incredibly uh, exciting time. And I think even Sunil captured this. And he said, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have touched this problem uh, up until just recently, right? And I think uh, we wanted to demonstrate that that coupling with partners like ANSYS, um, like EOS, uh, we can enable these uh, capabilities that weren't possible. Um, for those of you out there, and I'm also reviewing the questions here, you know, um, our implicit geometry enables you to do things that you couldn't do previously. And I think uh, we, we want to emphasize that here. So um, with that said, 
Um, we have quite a few questions and we'll attempt to, to answer some of those. Um, let's see. So uh, we have one question uh, from a, 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 an attendee here and it says, uh, they have a modeling code where they need to find a point is inside a solid or out. And then does N topology make it easier to do this? Um, I'd be happy to follow up um, with this asker uh, in that um, a little bit more about our uh, geometry is that we use sign distance fields uh, in addition to um, uh, our implicit geometry model. And as part of that, um, if a point is in that positive domain of a sign distance field, we know it would be outside the object. If it's at the boundary, it would be zero. And if it was inside, it would be a negative value. So we can certainly do that quite easily. Um, I think this is a good question, maybe for Sunil. It says, uh, is there a plan to add conjugate heat transfer in Discovery Live? Um, that's definitely something that um, I think is on the roadmap. Um, I'm not, I'm not the authority on Discovery Live, or I'm not allowed to, you know, uh, make those kind of comments. But it's, it's definitely on our plans. So, so I can't say like when it's there, but no, definitely on the uh, roadmap. We alluded to that um, we are in the process of evaluating these experimentally, and we'll be presenting those results probably in Q1 or Q2 of 2021. Um, let's see. Uh, Mikey, this might be a good question for you. It says, uh, how would you approach the geometry design for a liquid air heat exchanger? It would be very similar to, I think, what we ha have shown here. The, I think really the art of working with these complex TPMS structures is going to be how, A, we choose to plumb them, and also the baffle generation or barrier generation that we need to to keep the, the two fluids from mixing. So I, I would say, um you know just fill your fill your domain space with your tpms structure and then think about how how you're going to get the flow the fluids in there and and plumb them like you got a couple other questions here for you these are going to be a few it says um there's a question that says do you risk losing the self-supporting nature of the tpms shape if you change the aspect ratio or wall thickness you do, yes. So at some point, um, you you will most certainly. Now, in this particular case, we're only stretching it in the the vertical direction, so we're not really losing the self-supporting nature in, in the vertical direction. If we were to change the geometry or the shape in such a way in the X or Z directions, then then we would. Um, a good example of that would be some of these structures, right? All of these here on these images are printable from the bottom up, but as soon as you start to orient them in different ways, then then they want to be. I think there's um one question here in regards to the simulation. It says, what's the pressure and the temperature of the fluid inside the heat exchanger? I, I might just take that one. I think in this scenario, we, we were looking at examples of a um, fuel, and oil of a turbine engine for aerospace applications, so much like our previous design. And uh, and, um, and if we can follow up with you, if you'd like to learn more about those, but those typical operating scenarios for those. Um, okay. Um, another question was, uh, and this could be for you, Mikey. It says, um, this liquid to liquid heat exchanger looks great. Have you looked at cold wall or heat sink applications? For single fluid, air, or liquid? Uh, we we have looked at heat sink applications, and um, coincidentally enough, that's actually what we're seeing on screen here is a design iteration or, or design of experiment study that we did on three different types of TPMS structures with a handful of different parameters uh, that we were controlling to find a the lightest, but be and more importantly the the most effective 
And then, uh, Mikey, I have a, a favor to ask of you. Could you show um, a slide that indicates the um, that how we actually uh, designed in the removal of powder to the design? Yeah, so good question. Um, might be a little hard to see here, but at the bottom of the the blue part, we have these little turrets. You you could picture like a an old time castle, uh, one of the towers that have the the turrets for arrows. And the manufacturers, in this case EOS, asked us if we could put these turrets there so that when the part finishes, the wire EDM that's going to go through and cut off that initial support structure um, doesn't ruin their their uh, their wire. And in this particular case, they actually made a comment that the majority of the powder uh, drained out from these these portholes. So um, I have a maybe a two-part question. Uh, uh, this would be both maybe for me and for Sunil. And it's, um, is it possible to do coupled multi-physics simulation like mechanical and thermal? And furthermore, automatically optimize those designs? And I think maybe the first part to this would be that um, right now we are you know, a bespoke tool separate from ANSYS right now. And so um, the key there is for us to be able to pass information at least initially geometry information to ANSYS, and then ultimately pass results from ANSYS back to our tool as fields, right? Um, and maybe Sunil, you could elaborate on uh, methods in general, maybe related to ANSYS products about coupling those together. So the question was coupling uh, mechanical, uh, structural and thermal simulations, is that correct? Or just even multi-physics, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, um, in theory, yes. Uh, the, what's so we do that, and we've been doing that with B-rip geometries for a long time. And I also want to kind of uh, some somebody made a comment. Um, you were surprised that norm or expect ex exception. I want to kind of address that. Um, it's it's not a problem. Geometry or meshing or multi physics is not a problem. What was um, interesting or, or what caught me by surprise by how easy it, is, it was for us to work with these STLs with implicit geometry you know, features, uh, we had no idea. And especially when you wanna get um, nice uh, heat transfer between the thin solid regions and the fluid regions, uh, you wanna capture that geometry adequately. And that was the easy, but, but um, it also applies to the multiphysics. Um, if we can mesh it, the multiphysics is straightforward. And with this first effort of working with this kind of geometry with fair de degree of complexity, um, it seems like the technology is there already. Yeah, so. Um, Yeah, so a couple a couple questions here related to ANSYS and NTOP integrations. I think the key here is that we're two separate companies, and although um, uh, we do have overlap and capability, we are separate, and there are no plans for us to to merge together at this time. So um, I think in this case, we're uh, I would say on the NTOP side, uh, Mikey and and I are uh, closely partnered with uh, Sunil and ANSYS. Uh, because we're just engineers trying to solve problems, right? Like much of you, and I think that's possibly why you're in attendance here today. So that's a that's a key here for us. Um, uh, again, these slides will also be uh, available and uh, for download, so we will make those available through Revolution and uh, Simulation. And then, um, uh, you know, there's a great question, and and I can answer it. It's the, and the question was, how does the overall price of this compare to the standard route of manufacturing? And I think uh, as like all good engineers, I think uh, maybe we can all agree here is it depends, right? And, and certainly um, one thing that comes with advanced manufacturing, whether that's multi-axis machining or, or um, advanced casting methods using printed molds, uh, or in this case, just printing apart using laser powder bed fusion, is that uh, that manufacturing, um, cost has uh, has the potential to be more expensive than more traditional means right and so i think in this scenario though that the huge increase in performance uh, especially in 
space constrained environments like warrants the additional cost. And uh, you know, anytime we have a uh, a cost to performance ratio, we need to factor that in. I think in this case we're showing huge capability increases, and I think therefore that could justify that additional cost. Um, you know, there's oftentimes uh, I've been involved in some programs where heat exchangers were holding up uh, major um, acquisition programs simply because uh, parts were failing due to brazing joints and manufacturing and skilled labor pipelines and everything. You know, the other piece to that is, you know, assembly of parts. When you only have one part, there is no assembly, right? But if you have 40 of them, now you have to put that together. You have potential for failure. So it's really kind of, um, and uh, additive manufacturing in general uh, has to tackle that problem as how does an in increased process cost um, justify uh, part performance? And um, I'm happy to, if others want to add to that. Um, I think uh, the other key, and maybe you could go to this slide, Mikey, would be to to show our contact info. If anybody wants to reach out to us at ANSYS or NTOP, um, our emails will be included in this PDF, and you'd be more than happy to reach out to us in terms of um, collaboration or learning more about this process. Uh, the the goal of this project is that this is uh, I don't I don't want to call it completely open source, but um, the IP of this is is uh, belongs to Anthropology and Ansys, and we're more than happy to share that geometry to our customers, so uh, or potential customers. And so, if you would like to learn more about this process or how it's done, we will have those available as part of some sort of um, engagement, a follow-on engagement. I think with that said, uh, we're coming up on, uh, we've actually gone past the hour. Uh, I think we addressed a, a multitude of questions unless there's uh, anything I missed from the panel that you'd like to address. Um, with that said, I think that might be a great opportunity to hand it off to our hosts um, to conclude. I want to actually uh, comment one more. I just saw a last question come in. Um, how do you know something goes wrong? Uh, I'm actually very grateful that you asked that question. So this is kind of for us and Nancis the the first installment of this project. We're also in partners with Synopsys and North Star Imaging, who are going to take the the printed parts that you see, scan them, look for void zones, and uh, ultimately, we're going to compare those scans to to how it was designed and see if anything did go wrong, and then ultimately, um, you know, test them as Ryan said. So, so be on the lookout for for further installments of this of this case study. Great. Well, thank you very much, everybody, and I think um, uh, I think that we'll we'll call that the conclusion of our webinar. Um, I uh, and, and, I do want to say thank you to all our participants, especially uh, Sunil and Ansys and Andreas for uh, um, joining us today, and then also for the Revolution and Simulation folks for hosting this webinar. Wish you all uh, a great day and um, look forward to talking to you more.